good morning everyone. Thank you so much for uh, coming along to today's breakfast event uh, with uh, Angela, AMGC, Mark Forged, uh, Blue Zone Group and SF Design. I you know, really, really appreciate you guys coming down here from all parts of, of Perth to, to listen and learn. So for the next half an hour, I'll be talking about how you and your organization can build an additive manufacturing strategy. So. Let me first just ask everyone, does everyone know what additive manufacturing is? Right. Okay, so m most people here know what additive manufacturing is. So uh, additive manufacturing has come out of 3D printing. So it's like the industrial version of 3D printing. I assume everyone knows what 3D printing is. So uh, how many people in here are using some type of additive manufacturing or 3D printing uh, today just to get a feel? So probably about half of the group, right? So talking to the, you know, kind of the, the converted crowd, right? So, um, this is kind of the, the agenda, so I'll go through why now is a good time to be looking at this. I had a conversation with a couple of people that kind of agreed with me that this is a good time to investigate uh, new technologies and new strategies. And then, how? You know, how do we start? So, like Angela said, let's start with small steps. And let's look at some companies that are doing it already and you know, how they're doing it. Um, and where do you go from here? So just to introduce myself, I, my name is Richard. So I'm the director for Mark Forged. Uh, so I look after all of Asia Pacific, uh, anything from, you know, I live here in Perth, but anything from Perth to Sydney, to Philippines, to Singapore, to India, um, you name it. So. Uh, before COVID, I spent my time flying uh, across the region, meeting manufacturers such as yourself. Uh, now with COVID, I've got a lot more time here in Perth, so happy to come and uh, see any of you. Um, so I've been in the manufacturing industry for 15 years. Uh, I worked for companies such as Autodesk and SolarWorks before I joined Mark Forge as a director. Um, so I visited over 10,000 uh, manufacturers and probably 5,000 of them are here in Perth. So, you know, uh, whatever company it is, I've spent the last 10 years visiting companies and driving up and down all of the industrial areas. So uh, chances is that we've, you know, if you're in the industry, we may have come across or our parts have met in the past. Um, so Mark Forged. Uh, one of the key reasons why I joined this company uh, was that the company was transitioning out of these toys. So when I, I got the call and I got to hear about Mark Forge, I was thinking about toys, you know, printing these Yoda heads and fidget spinners. But when I investigated the company and I went to Boston to, to see what the company were doing, you know, it kind of blew me away that this company was actually producing real world parts. So that's one of the key reasons why I joined three years ago. Um, so this company, uh, they manufacture all the products uh, in Boston, uh, but obviously we're proud uh, to employ people in Australia. So we have a few people uh, you know, on the ground uh, across the region. I've got colleagues over east and local distributors. So obviously, even though we're not making the products here, we are uh, helping with Australian jobs and hopefully uh, helping manufacturers around the region. So. The company shipped its first product only um, you know, six years ago in 2014 um, and is a good example of a manufacturer that's grown rapidly. So in six years from uh, Greg Mark sitting in his living room uh, studying at MIT to building a global company uh, that has now over $140 million in funding from Microsoft, Porsche, uh, Siemens and you know seven, eight figures in, in revenue is, is truly, uh, truly, truly remarkable. So I do believe that there are people in this room and in Perth that have the, you know, the kind of the capabilities to hopefully replicate uh, something like this or as a manufacturer. So I guess what gives me, you know, besides I've visited a lot of companies, worked with a lot of manufacturers, but what gives Mark Forge also credibility and why I humbly kind of am up here sharing uh, with you guys is that this presentation, this tactics, this strategy has been implemented by some of the largest companies in the world, right? So whether you're a, uh, we talked about Amazon, whether you're a Tesla, whether you're a NASA, this is the strategy at high level. So obviously I've only got 30 minutes, but this is the high level strategy that these companies uh, have looked at and embraced. All of these companies are using the technology and many of them 
kind of started with a conversation like today to implement the, the, the technology. So what are the, all of these companies and all of the things that Angela was talking about, what do they have in common? I believe it's innovation. And a lot of them that were on the list, they're like the f most innovative companies in the world that was on that list, right? So hand on your heart, I mean, are you, are you working for an innovative company or, or you know, is your company innovative, right? I think we all need to ask ourselves, right? And personally, you know, thanks to COVID, I think this is a fantastic time to really look at yourself and look at your business and think, can I reinvent myself? Can I reinvent my business? And I do believe that innovation is key for all of us to not only survive, but to thrive in this new world that is here. That is my own personal perspective. And even before COVID, this whole digital transformation uh, that Angela talked about had already started. But of course, with COVID, all of these trends about living in a digital world, operating in a digital world, is only being accelerated, right? So we have lots of these industry trends, uh, and we kind of created this presentation even before COVID. These things are only getting accelerated because we're living in this digital world. So where we talked about labor, uh, you know, conditions of finding skilled labor. Uh, we've talked a little bit about one-on-one -on -one with uh, people here about supply chain uh, challenges and getting shipments from overseas delivered on time. Uh, or the things are changing rapidly. We heard about people learning things from YouTube rather than uh, um, having a bachelor degree, right? Because things are moving so, so quickly. Uh, so I would, I would say that these things and these trends are only going to accelerate over the next few months, the next few years, however long this will last. And I actually don't think that things will go back to the way things were. That's my view. So what, what, what have we seen in the last few months? Again, just to, to think about why now? Well, lots of Australian manufacturers um, have been impacted by COVID. And, and obviously, my heart goes out to everyone in Melbourne, uh, uh, where lots of our customers have not been able to go back to their office or to their factory for almost six months, right? Being locked up at home. Uh, and what this is forcing companies to do is to reinvent themselves or repurpose their factory and come up with new ways, right? So, hey, do you want to thrive or do you want to just survive, right? So. These are great examples of, in Australian manufacturing, there will be losers and there will be winners. Some of them, um, just to mention an example, not to point out one, uh, we have seen um, companies like such as Kmart uh, sitting with empty shelves, right? There's no, there's no product to sell. They don't have any supply because they've been struck by supply chain challenges out of China. Uh, we have seen like one of our customers that I'll talk more about, uh, MicroX in Adelaide, that are, you know, they're at, in an absolutely booming um, industry right now with their technology. So there will be winners, there will be losers. And again, even before COVID, um, you know, half of the Fortune 500 was replaced, uh, you know, in the last 15 years. So 52% of the Fortune 500 companies have all disappeared. And what we can see is the average tenure of a Fortune 500 company has gone from in the past, you know, being there for 55 years to expected in 2026 to be there for 14 years. So what does this mean? It means that a lot of companies will not survive. That's, that's the reality uh, of it. So this is why we're all here today to kind of learn and to make sure that we don't, everyone in this room, like we are all relevant in the future. And when I was putting together this presentation, it kind of got me thinking about the past because we've looked into the future. What was it like in the past? So if you were manufacturing uh, back in the early 1900s, guess what? You were using steam engines in your factory. This is obviously before electricity and electric motors. And the steam, uh, the electrical engine, as you can see, or the electricity was introduced in the er early 1900s for manufacturers. But it wasn't until 20 years later um, where uh, you know, it kind of became the, the norm in manufacturing. So steam engines were powering the factories. They were noisy, they were big, and they re required lots of labor. 
And we can see at the same time at the inflection point when um, the electrical motors were introduced to manufacturing, so did the productivity uh, increase. So of course, for the factory owners that were running their factories based on steam, to switch to electricity, which took them 20 to 30 years, they had to change their thinking. They had to shift how uh, they thought about manufacturing processes and obviously to overcome these constraints and move towards the electrical motor. The traditional way of manufacturing, um, whether it's been in Australia or whether we've been making, or making things overseas in the last few years, you can see these kind of supply chains, especially now with COVID, has been weighing us down where there's been a manufacturing hub, whether that's been in Perth or whether that's been in, in China, then then has basically then been distributed through third-party logistics. There might have been a hub like Singapore where you've stored uh, things or had your, your warehouse. Then it's been, once it's reached shore, then it's been regionally shipped out to eventually end up where the point of need of the customer is. And of course, for each one of these steps, that adds costs, right? And of course, now in, in COVID, it also adds time. So if you were importing things from overseas or you were outsourcing manufacturing, that was adding a lot of cost and adding a lot of time. So what a lot of these companies that I mentioned at the beginning, what their vision is, not saying that they're all there today, is having a digital inventory. So imagine that you have 3D models of all the parts, everything that you make, right? And then these parts can then be manufactured, whether it's locally or wherever the customer is, uh, through a local you know, or a global parts manager who can then trigger the manufacturing anywhere in the world, wherever the customer is or wherever the need is. So using this kind of digital inventory, all of these companies are looking at printing or making parts on demand rather than making all of these things, storing in a warehouse, then shipping it. When there's an order coming in, and like if we take the Amazon, they've, they've now been approved for drone delivery. You can imagine in the future where they get an order, then the part or the component, whatever it is that you're ordering is being made, and then it's being distributed locally. Right? So why are companies like Tesla, Walmart, or Amazon looking at this? Well, it's obviously reducing lead time and reducing costs. It's not saying that the answer is not here today, but this is the vision of a lot of these these companies, right? So if if they had a if if you order it here and they there's a printer locally and they can send the order to the printer and then that can get delivered by a drone delivery, Amazon basically just takes care of the communication and the inventory. So the vision here, as you can see on the left, right, is the process that a lot of us are going through as manufacturer. You know, you do the design, you do the prototyping, you do the tooling, you do the production, you manage all your logistics. And the way things are going to be made in the future, we believe, is through this digital inventory where things can be made on demand, whether it's a prototype or a product or a tool. So. Why now? Before we get into the how, I like to believe that, hey, if you, you might be very busy, you might be having more time, um, there might be this tsunami of challenges in front of us. I like to believe that this is a great opportunity to build your business plan. And whether that business plan in involves additive manufacturing, great, let's talk. May not involve man additive manufacturing, but I do believe having a good plan so that you can transform your business in the new normal, I think that that's, that's key. So, Richard, we've heard about all of these things about 3D printing and additive manufacturing. You know, it's been around uh, since 1986. We, 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 you know, we've seen the Yoda heads and fidget spinners. The reality is it's really in the last three years where 3D printing has been at a point where it can actually replace parts that have been made traditionally. So you can see uh, here that over the last you know, 30 years, the industry has matured and we've kind of gone through the hype where people were going to print everything at home and the dishwasher components and all of that uh, and we've now ended up at a point from I would say 2017 onwards 
where parts that are being printed are at such quality that in some cases that can replace traditional manufacturing. Um, and you know the, the, the printers and the technology has all come to a point where they're fast enough to produce parts. Of course, this will continue. So you can just look into the future here about you know the benefits of 3D printing. Why are companies adopting this? And, and obviously, 3D printing is get a, getting a lot of attention now in the media. Uh, and you know, there's articles wherever you go you can find about you know 3D printing. The fact is that we are seeing you know about 4x the growth in additive manufacturing over the next five you know, five years. So. Uh, two years ago, it was an $8 billion industry. Uh, by uh, 2023, 2024, we expect it to be $28 uh, billion industry. And this is according to Waller's report, which is an independent um, research company. You can find the report online. So we've talked about this. So why, why uh, for you as a business owner? And this might be a bit controversial. I do believe that there will be jobs in the future that are no longer relevant and there will be new job opportunities. There's a massive demand at the moment. If you are an expert in 3D printing or designing for 3D printing, there's lots and lots of jobs. If you're an expert in this as a subject matter, there's lots of jobs. On the other hand, there will be jobs that are manual or very labor intensive that we believe will not be around in the, in the future. So when you look at additive manufacturing, it's a bit hard to see. There's a consistent cost. So whether you make one component or you make 100, that cost does not change. So let's say that it's $20 to print something. Whether you make one or 100, it's $20 per part. Traditional manufacturing is obviously the more you make, the cheaper it gets. Like you look at molding or you look at like CNC. If you could automate the process, that's you know, where you can save a lot of money. So we're kind of at this inflection point where if you're mass producing, I would still say that, of course, traditional manufacturing will be around for a long, long time. But additive manufacturing is taking more and more market share and really comes down to if you're in the low volume, high value, that's still where 3D printing is today and can help your business. If you're in low volume, high, va you know, high production, traditional manufacturing will still be around for many, many years. You can imagine you as a business owner in the near future where the only person that, that runs the factory is you. So this is an example of our um, print farm in Boston. We have one operator that's producing over 15,000 parts per month. So this factory runs lights out 24 seven. There is no one basically there. He can monitor it from his phone on an app how the production is going from all of these machines. We're collaborating with robot manufacturers that are now removing the parts from the printer and putting in a new print bit. So it might seem scary to some of you, but for, for some business owners in the room, you might go, well, hey, you know, maybe in the future I can, I'll run my own manufacturing shop. You know, we don't necessarily need people to do the manufacturing. So this is very much happening. I won't go into too much details. Uh, I'll, let's just look at you know, how and, and where 3D printing is today. So if we look at some of these uh, applications, right? So things like, as I mentioned, like toys and, and, and things like the concept modeling, we don't really focus on this. Like that's the traditional 3D printing spot. Where we are really uh, focusing on right now is things like that are like high impact, low risk. So like spare parts or replacement parts, service maintenance tools or low to mid volume parts and components right we don't focus on it but there's other companies out there that are focusing on things like medical implants so first you got to obviously look at your parts and your components what can 3d printing do for your business today so in general these are kind of like the the sweet spots i would say the yellow components like various types of tools in your factory work holding functional testing validation um, you know, low to mid volume components. And I would say that parts that are the size of your two hands that requires very, very much precision and that can be made by a click of a button, that's kind of where 3D printing is today. For anything that's larger, you know, you want to print a car, you want to print a house, 
commercial 3D printing with the click of a button is not there today. So that's the reality. That's what 3D printing is of 2020. So let's get, let's get to the how. Let's say, okay, we're on board. We want to learn more about this. So how do we do this? So this was just a quote from Deloitte that we took. It's about implementing new technology, right? Requires organizations to think about a strategy and thinking outside of the machinery. Like to Angela's point, do we have customers that bought one of our printers uh, and not, doesn't use it? Yeah, it happens, right? Maybe someone got a government grant and they got it all for free. But obviously that's not a successful business transformation, but it happens, just being honest and upfront about it. So we believe when we work with these companies, there are three areas, the people, the process, and the technology. Now, I'd like to say that it's probably in that order. The number one hurdle that I see in WA or in Australia is mindset and people and how open-minded people are to change. It doesn't matter if it's, I mean, I've worked for many technology companies. It doesn't matter what it is. So let's look at some of these things. So these are the three key areas. So let's look at this framework that we've developed. It all starts with a business problem. If you have a problem or you don't have a problem, you might be unaware, blissfully unaware of problems that you have. But I like to suggest start with your looking at your own company and the problems that you may or may not have. Maybe there's some other things that I've mentioned, but you have to really, really start there. We would encourage you to pick a strategic partner. Doesn't have to be Mark Forge, doesn't have to be AMGC, could be anyone. Could be Deloitte, could be a friend of a friend, could be someone with a YouTube degree. Uh, and, you know, once you have that kind of, you know, some partner to help you, uh, we suggest that you create this team or you give someone the responsibility for implementing this strategy. Then you look at, okay, once we, we have the problem, we have the team, how can, how do we currently make things? And how, is it possible for that to be workflow to be transitioned into additive manufacturing? If it can, then let's look at how do we educate? How do we enable people to learn how to use 3D printing? And then of course, like any uh, business, it has to make financial sense. If it doesn't reduce cost or it doesn't reduce lead time, it's not the right application or it's not the right technology. So you have to really, it has to make sense for your business. Then kind of the next gateway is validating those parts. So then maybe you, you get those parts made for your business and then you do a trial and error. Did it reduce cost? Did it reduce time? Did it work? Was your customer, your, like our customer's customer, were they happy with the parts? And then finally, the, you look at an operational plan of how to implement this for your organization and build the roadmap. And then finally, you might put some final proposal of all of the costs from education through implementation and you, you get the director of the company to kind of give his sign off uh, before you implement the strategy. So. The number one challenge to all of this, and you I mean you might find yourself in one of these three camps right now. You might be in shock, you know, and and and, and you know, there's so much to think about, you know, with 3D printing, and, and you end up in this analysis paralysis. So uh, let's let's not worry about it. Or the ivory tower, uh, 3D printing, you know, will happen in the future, or uh, it's just for prototyping, it's just for for toys. Or, you know, yeah, I know, I know someone who bought a printer, yeah, it wasn't that great, you know, they didn't get great results, or, you know, we'll, we'll get to that someday isle, uh, island, <laughs> right? So if we just quickly break down some of these things, just to help you, if you look at the business problem, is what's your biggest problem? How much money are you losing? What's the value at stake? Right, you have to th start thinking about these, like, KPIs that Angela mentioned, like how does the KPI of this align with your organizational goals? Right. Selecting the, 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 the right partner, I mean, here's a, here's a good quote. Research suggests that one of the most effective ways to collaborate is to develop external non-competing partnership to anticipate and adjust new paradigm. So maybe there's someone in this room Maybe the, the, maybe you're doing some networking, some collaboration. Maybe the person next to you thinks like, yeah, I've been thinking about 3D printing. Well, let's, let's collaborate on this. Maybe we share the costs. 
And I do believe that there has to be some kind of ownership. Right? So I mean, hey, this, this is obviously if we look at a large organization, they might have a committee, they might have a whole team. Typically manufacturers here, unless you're a you know, big global company, it might be one or two people that take ownership. Right? And there has to be someone, I believe, that has some kind of executive sponsorship to navigate within your own organization unless you're the, the business owner. And then when you look at these kind of application work streams, there are limitations of 3D printing, absolutely. There's probably limitations in the traditional way of making things as well. So we suggest that each person that's tasked with this is looking at what are the requirements for these parts that you're looking at making. Maybe there's cost, maybe there's weight, maybe there's you know, tensile strength, whatever it might be. All right, so these are our requirements. These are the parts that are causing delays or supply chain issue, or that's very labor intensive. And maybe there's some non-crucial parts in your organization. Maybe there's things that you can start with that doesn't really, you know, doesn't have to reinvent the entire business today. Maybe there's a small step like Angela mentioned. Maybe there's one component in, so that at least you can get the knowledge and the know-how to prepare for the, for the future. And then of course, you, you do need training uh, in, in terms of how to implement this type of technology. Um, so again, could be through a partnership, could be working like through someone with us, could be like a consulting firm, someone to help you uh, develop this kind of educational plan. I, I certainly spend a lot of time uh, with my local partners at the moment um, to develop these business plans, right? Or, or return on investment proposals because if there's something that's true now in, in particular in these times if it doesn't make financial sense it's not going to happen so again does it scale is it possible to make a financial impact and then finally you work with your partner to test the components versus the real uh, you know components so you have a theory then you basically print the parts and you test them and you might validate them against things like of course savings and lead time, rate them maybe from one to four. How are they holding up in the field? Is there fatigue, is there wear, is there any weight improvement, any ergonomic benefits? And you compare how you're currently making it to the additive manufacturing way of doing it. All right? And then obviously then you must have an operational plan to roll this out in your organization. That might be like with many of these organizations, we build a 36-month plan. That's the reality. Uh, we build a 36-month plan so that in 36 months, that's when the hallelujah moment is and they've implemented all of these things and the vision of the digital inventory. Uh, but today, it may be with this small little component that was causing them you know, challenges. All right. And hey, if you're the business owner in this room, great, fantastic. You know, you don't need the approval of anyone else, maybe the bank. <laughs> but uh, if you're a designer, an engineer, I do believe that it's important to make the business owner of your organization aware from, from the get-go that, hey, I'm looking at building this strategy, I'm looking at building this for our organization and try to get the executives on board. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. And of course, uh, just to finish off, the, this can all happen in parallel. It doesn't have to be exactly like the way that I explain it, but you know, some of these things can be taken in parallel, like selecting the partnership, creating the team, you know, building out the applications for your organization. So let's look at some examples and kind of where we, we go from here. So I mentioned um, MicroX. So this is a great uh, company. I wish they were West Australian. They're South Australian, so almost. <laughs> um, this company uh, have been using the, the additive manufacturing or forge technology uh, for about a year. And when COVID hit, um, of course, for them that are developing these X-ray scanners that can basically detect, uh, you know, COVID or read people's temperature. Uh, they've also developed these robot. Um, uh, what do you call them, robots that are mobile that they can basically place at a stadium and they can x-ray not only the temperature but they can x-ray for guns, 
or for bombs or components or whatever it might be, right? That, uh, and they've received orders now from US defense, Australian defense, uh, you know, police forces around the world that are looking at placing these mobile robots um, to, to check for all of these, um, you know, COVID or to, to X-ray scan, right? And they were hit by the, um, uh, the, the supply chain constraints uh, when COVID started. Using additive manufacturing, they've been able to print parts that they would before were making in, in China. Because obviously their orders uh, increased rapidly when COVID hit. They had these supply chain constraints and they were able to overcome this with uh, additive manufacturing. We are also, uh, just on that theme, we are working with the Australian uh, Defence Force um, on the vision of being able to print parts in field on demand. You can imagine what the benefit would be um, of placing these types of 3D printers in a container. You drop ship the container into a war zone or in Iraq or whatever it might be. Any components, anything that you need, obviously you can't just get things made uh, in the middle of Iraq or Afghanistan or wherever it might be. So being able to 3D print these components in the field on time is a huge, huge uh, benefit for, uh, for them, right? We've been working with companies like Caldwell, and we'll hear from Blue Zone Group in, in a moment, where these, this company saved over $400 per part that they printed, and were able to get to, to the market faster by being able to print components. Siemens is one of our investors uh, and also one of our uh, biggest customers. So they use additive manufacturing throughout a lot of their facilities, um, again, to keep their factory going. So this particular uh, tool for support and maintenance of their factory, that was all previously made using traditional, um, manufact uh, traditional manufacturing and now they're printing the entire tool. And the cost savings that they're making, uh, you can see here over $8,000 saved on prototypes. All right, so if, if you're able to print things for $20, $50, $100, $200, about traditional one-off custom tools might cost you $10,000. We've, we've got examples like this uh, where you can make components on demand, right? Or lifting tool uh, from uh, Vetschler. Uh, you know, 100k saved in one month by basically printing these tools uh, that are lifting up the um, engines, right? So the 3D printed uh, lifting gear here can hold up to over 10 tons of engines that they're moving in their factory. So rather than traditional manufacturing, they're just uh, 3D printing. We have examples in the automotive industry uh, that have been printed, whether it's gears, components, prototypes. Um, Something that's booming at the moment in Australia is the drone industry, printing like custom drones, uh, surveillance, uh, various types of tools, uh, R and D. You know, we've got Aussie customers printing anything from camera lenses to robotic components. Uh, lots of various manufacturing industry applications printing anything from like copper components to stainless steel components. Um, so there's there's lots and lots and lots of these examples. So, just to finish off before I hand over to, to Mark, um, why I believe Mark Forge is a good partner on your journey. Uh, obviously, we have people. Um, we have people from um, industry that work for us. We have partners such as SF Design that have experience from working in the manufacturing industry through design, through engineering. Um, so, we are able to help you find the right people in your organization. Uh, we know how to implement this type of technology. We know how to work with manufacturers uh, to, to basically map out the entire process. And then finally, the technology. So this is enterprise grade type of technology. So we build and manufacture this industrial 3D printing platform. So everything from the software through to the hardware, through to the material, we all design and make and deliver to, uh, to our customers. So I believe we have a um, Q&A after Mark's uh, presentation. I'm sure you have lots of, of, of questions. So uh, with that, I'd like to say thank you for, for listening. Happy to answer any questions after Mark. And I'd like to hand over to Mark from uh, Blue Zone Group. Thank you so much, guys. <laughs>